him down and oh my soul so weary when troubles come and my heart burdened be then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit away mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas I am strong when I am on your shoulders you raise me up to more than I can be
Lord, thou hast been our great days in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever thou hast formed the earth and the world. Even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and say, Return ye children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, Yet shall he live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, then from my foot. I will see God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Things beyond our seeing, things beyond our hearing, things beyond our imagining, God has reserved to love him. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Absent from body, present with the Lord, which is far better. God is thy refuge, is thy dwelling place, are the everlasting arms. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law he doth meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth its fruit in a season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does, shall prosper. We are gathered as God's people to celebrate the homegoing of one of his choice servants. We offer sincerest condolences to his widow and children and the immediate members of the family. But we feel that all of us are a part of his family. Our opening hymn, praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet my tribute bring. This hymn was sung 50 years ago this November when Peter and Madge got married. We celebrate the story and we offer our praise to God.
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who in Jesus Christ stood by the graveside of Lazarus in the company of Mary and Martha and wept. Despite the fact that he knew that in a few short moments he would call Lazarus from the grave and say, Lazarus, come forth. And in a few days he himself was to be raised triumphant over death and the grave. He went. So we thank you that we found to our God, and that we have a high priest who is acquainted with our grief. One who has passed through the heavens, whoever lives to make intercession for us. So when we confront our mortality, when we are confronted by our loss, when death has come and taken our loved ones away, we thank you that we do not need to pretend that it is not so or tell ourselves some story as if it is not real. For we have a God who understands. Does Jesus care when I've lost on earth the dearest on earth to me? Is it all to him? Does he see? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is aware of my grief. So when the long nights weary and the days are dreary, I know my Savior cares. But it is our faith to know about death, but to hope for the morning. For sorrow may last for a night, for joy comes in the morning. And we thank you that we are the people of the resurrection. The people who know that Jesus, as the songwriter says, go from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph o'er his foes, he arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. So we come here today to thank you for Jesus, to thank you for the gift of his grace, including his son, our friend and brother and colleague and loved one, Peter Spencer. We come here to worship him, who is altogether lovely, who is the bright and morning star, who is the fairer than 10,000 to our soul, to lift him higher, that he may draw men and women to himself. May the words of scripture read and spoken, may the hymn sung, may the words of tribute raised, May every word spoken redound to the glory of your great name and the good of your children. So take charge. Do your work yourself. Be God amongst God's people. Have your way. For we look to you with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please sit. It is not just the decorum and the decency, but also the discipline of the family that has constructed a program that will not last forever. And to that end, there are tributes that are written, and you will have to read them in the quietness of your homes. There are still others that were written on social media and an online condolence book. I'm sure you can retrieve them and read them. The family is deeply grateful for all the kind words that have been expressed. There are still others whose words came in too late to make it to either of the two places and again, were well received. Those who have been selected to speak 
are speaking on behalf of institution and others, not all of which are represented. We welcome them and we listen to them, but we know we have our tributes of our own that if we were given an opportunity, we also would speak. The Reverend Jacob McLean is chairman of the Missionary Church and he will bring a tribute on behalf of the MCA. He'll be followed by the Reverend Mr. Omar Morrison, who is the vice president, vice chairman, and is going to speak on behalf of the ministers of the Missionary Church and may extend it to other members of the clergy. Then we'll have an item from the Grace Trio, a musical tribute. And then the, follow, the tribute that will follow will be by Mr. Linroy Marshall, Elder of First Missionary Church, Chairman of the Board of the Jamaica Theological Seminary. When Reverend Morrison speaks, the clergy of the Missionary Church will stand. And when Mr. Marshall speaks, the members of the JTS family will stand. I invite them now to bring their tributes. Moderator, Reverend Dr. Garnet Roper, colleague, ministers on the platform, colleague, ministers in the audience, the congregation, esteemed brothers and sisters, bereaved family, friends, well-wishers, good morning. Tribute to Reverend Peter Nathaniel Cyril Spencer, JP, DD, on behalf of the Missionary Church Association in Jamaica. The late Reverend Spencer epitomized the vision and passion of the founding fathers of the Missionary Church Association in Jamaica, MCAJ. He loved the Lord and the ministry with all his heart. Gifted with an incisive mind, a powerful presence, and a clear and resounding voice, he truly used his giftings to serve the Lord and made his mark on the MCAJ as its longest serving president. His leadership was visionary and encompassed the spiritual, administrative, and transformational spheres. As a youngster, Peter became a believer at the Emmanuel Missionary Church in Mandeville. He enrolled as a member of the charter class of the Jamaica Theological Seminary and graduated with the first graduation class of 1963, having obtained the Bachelor of Theology degree. He later pursued studies at the then Columbia Bible College, now Columbia International University in the United States, and significantly was its first black student. He was ordained to the Christian ministry with the MCAJ in 1965 and was assigned to the pastorate of the First Missionary Church, East Street, Kingston, where he faithfully served for 24 years, 1965 to 1979, and again, 1998 to 2008. He completed 43 years of pastoral ministry in December 2008 and retired from active pastoral responsibilities in January 2009. Reverend Spencer was the first president of the MCAJ, serving from 1971 to 1995. He was a member of the Board of Governors of the Jamaica Theological Seminary from 1972, serving as chairman for several of those years. In honor of his longevity 
as a true and erudite scholar of the word, he was conferred with the honorary doctor of divinity by the Caribbean Graduate School of Theology in July 2010. He was a man of great dignity and integrity who was thoroughly grounded in the truths of God's words. He preached the whole truth fearlessly, stood his ground where principles and standards were concerned. He represented the denomination well in several capacities as well and was well known as an elder statesman of the Jamaican church. As a speaker on the Grace Hour broadcast, the voice of the MCAJ in Jamaica for many years, he was much loved by listeners who were captivated by his profound and uplifting sermons, none to mention his mellifluous voice. Being very meticulous, he paid great attention to details as an administrator and was a proficient record keeper and organizer. His legacy in this area will live on in the files of the MCAJ. Reverend Spencer was a man of action as president of the denomination. He was able to get things done, ensure that he had his finger on the pulse, and was a repository of organizational knowledge from which he drew from time to time to provide advice and guidance. His financial acumen was outstanding. He was an investor at heart. This undoubtedly enabled him to lay a solid foundation of sound investments, which has served to steady the MCAJ ship in rough weather many a times. Even after retirement, he was always willing, when called upon, to go to JMMB to expedite the processing of transactions on behalf of the denomination. He fought the good fight, finished the race, and remained faithful. On behalf of the executive, pastors, national and regional leaders, and members of the MCAJ family of churches and associated institutions, I offer sincere condolences to Sister Cecilia Spencer Madge, his beloved and faithful partner, children, Lorianne and Greg and their families. We are confident that he is resting in peace with the Lord he loved so well. Good morning, everyone. My task is to pay tribute to the late Reverend Dr. Peter Spencer on behalf of his colleagues in the Missionary Church Association. May I ask them now to stand. The Reverend Dr. Peter N.C. Spencer, in life and witness, displayed the beauty and impact of a life touched by the transforming gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. His well-spent years has given us a unique opportunity both to reflect and to rejoice. We reflect because we know a humble giant has fallen. We rejoice because we know he has gone to be with Jesus, which is far better. Reverend Spencer's pastoral career began with a deep sense of call. He was driven by a sense of being chosen by God and given a special message. This led him, as you heard earlier, to be one of the first five students of the Jamaica Theological Seminary. JTS was instrumental in his ministerial formation. So too was the history-making opportunity of being the first student of color 
to study at the Columbia Bible College, now Columbia International University. This opportunity to study internationally early in his pastoral career served not only to increase his competence theologically, but also to build his character and stature. The Reverend Dr. Spencer accepted the call to pastor the First Missionary Church in 1965 after his JTS and CBC study. The church recalls, quote, from the moment he took over the pastorate, the leaders and the members had no doubt that he was sent from the Lord, end quote. As you heard, he served faithfully at First Church in two stints for 24 years. Reverend Spencer is greatly admired by his colleagues, the members of the First Missionary Church, the whole denomination, and many others outside of the denomination. He's admired for his integrity and impeccable character. He's greatly admired for his exemplary and passionate leadership which shone through his preaching, teaching, and administration. Because of the wide admiration held for Reverend Spencer, he was frequently referred to as Bishop of the MCAJ, Elder Statesman, Man of God, God's Servant, and Pastor to Pastor. Reverend Spencer served in many positions, which I need not state here. But he never let the titles, position, or respect go to his head because of his humility. As a shepherd, he was a good listener, caring, compassionate, understanding without surrendering his principles. Several of his colleagues found him to be a confidant a cheerleader, an encourager. One colleague remarked, quote, he always had such a peaceful aura and a welcoming smile, end quote. Reverend Spencer was passionate about teaching and preaching the scriptures and frequently encouraged his audience to go and read the text for themselves. <laughs> Several of his colleagues Remember how special it was for them to exchange pulpit with him. There was always the evidence of diligent preparation and a willingness to admit that he was still wrestling with the text for himself. Reverend Spencer's preaching and teaching, whether in the pulpit or on grace hour, was marked by precise diction moderate pace, amiable tone. His resonant voice brought comfort, challenge, and hope. Reverend Spencer was committed to impacting lives through the many areas of service he offered. Whether it was leading the charge to buy land on behalf of the denomination, investing on behalf of the denomination, or helping Kendall or JTS or several of the other boards that he, or entities that he served. He worked tirelessly and was legendary in his focus and commitment. During his ministry at FMC, the annex to the church was built, named after Reverend David Clark. So too was a new caretaker's cottage his expansion of the Horton Salmon Early Childhood Institution was also done. And his last big project at the church was to personally oversee the tiling of the entire sanctuary in 2008 to mark FMC's 80th anniversary. Such was part of his impact as a pastor on the ground. But as pastors, we would know, that the MCA General Conference is a special time for both pastors and delegates. When Reverend Spencer rose to contribute to a matter being discussed, he had a sense of presence 
that demanded attention. He was thoughtful, engaging, passionate, even tenacious if he thought that an important point was to be brought across and the conference was not getting it. He was not letting up, much sometimes to the dissatisfaction of some pastors who thought time is going and we needed to move on. Reverend Spencer knew that he had a role to shape a better denomination and he knew that if we got it right, we would be more effective in reaching more people for Christ. Reverend Peter, Peter Spencer is admired for, by his colleagues for his role as an ecumenical giant like the late Reverend Dr. Cleve Grant. He was a pastor who encouraged Christian unity, Christ-likeness, and dependence on the Holy Spirit. He recommended several of his colleagues to be guest preachers at the Keswick Conventions. After Reverend Peter Spencer retired, having served 43 years, he continued to be of immense blessing and support to many colleagues and the denomination. Since I had the privilege of being his immediate predecessor, I made sure, since he was my immediate predecessor rather, I made sure to invite him to preach periodically. On one occasion, I was scheduled to be overseas, but mistakenly scheduled myself to preach on the first Sunday. When I realized on the Tuesday, I quickly picked up the phone and I called Reverend Spencer and I requested that he make himself available to preach the word of the Lord. He says, Brother Omar, I need to pray about it. I said, Rev, I will hold. <laughs> and he did exactly what you did. He laughed and said, no, Brother Omar, give me at least two or three days. I quickly did the count and realized that I was up to Friday. Should I ask somebody else or do I wait? I knew the congregation at First Church would want to hear him. And so I nervously waited. I was about to board the plane on Friday morning when he called and said, Brother Omar, I will preach. <laughs> There's a sense in which Reverend Spencer's passing represents the end of an era in the MCA. He was a pastor from the old school in the sense that his commitment to the pastorate was foundational, singular, <coughs> long and distinguished. Reverend Spencer's death, in Reverend Spencer's death, we have lost a part of the, denominational, the denomination's institutional memory. Part of my own disappointment, and I'm sure that of some colleagues, is that he didn't take the time to write some of his own thoughts and reflections on the denomination and Christianity in particular. His contribution, as you will hear, extended to being a, a wonderful alumni of JTS to the very end. We have lost an exemplar of the Christian faith. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. All of us as colleagues have been given a wonderful example to follow. And we all know that he was not perfect, but he sought to follow Jesus Christ and would encourage us to do the same with passion and dependence on the Holy Spirit. Again, we express our condolences to his widow, Sister Madge, his faithful helpmate, to his children, Lorianne and Greg and the rest of the family and indeed all the extended family. Farewell, our brother, pastor to pastor, and statesman, elder statesman. We know you're resting in the Lord, and we'll meet again on the other side.
leave the words of this song reflect the life of Reverend Peter Spencer, servant of God. present this tribute on behalf of the board, president, and staff of the Jamaica Theological Seminary and invite all of the members of the JTS community to stand. <clears throat> uh, 
a lion of God, Peter Nathaniel Cyril Spencer, from early in his Christian life, had a passion to know Christ and to make him known. To know him, to know his power, the power of his resurrection, and to share the good news of salvation to all nations. He had no reservations about placing his hand in the hand of God and blazing a trail to prepare himself for service to his master. The board, president, and staff of JTS paid tribute to Reverend Spencer for the trail he blazed and the pioneering spirit he displayed, which saw him enter JTS in 1960, when JTS first opened its doors. He was one of a total of just four students in that first class, all of whom pursued the Bachelor of Theology. He graduated from JTS in 1963. His trailblazing continued when later that year, he became the first black student to attend Columbia Bible College, now Columbia International University. This was during the Jim Crow era, the period of deep racial segregation in America. His admission made CIU the first institution of higher education in South Carolina to admit a black student voluntarily as part of efforts to facilitate racial integration. There was more trailblazing to come for Reverend Spencer for when he was appointed president of the Missionary Church Association in Jamaica in 1971, and by virtue of that appointment was also appointed chairman of the Jamaica Theological Seminary. He was the first Jamaican to be appointed to those positions in which he served with distinction. We pay tribute to the steady hand of leadership insightful perspectives, informed and democratic decision-making, and respect for good order that Reverend Spencer displayed as he chaired the board of the seminary from 1971 through 1995. He led the board to seek utmost clarity in identifying issues being discussed in order to arrive at appropriate decisions and actions. We note some of the things that occurred or obtained during Reverend Spencer's tenure as chairman of JTS. Caribbean Graduate School of Theology was founded by the founder and first principal of JTS, Dr. Zenas Gehrig. The two worked together in a healthy cooperative relationship that benefited both schools. He maintained strong ties with the Missionary Church USA, under which JTS benefited, among other things, from missionaries being sent as qualified lecturers in those early days of JTS, with salaries being paid by MCA USA. He encouraged an exchange student program, which was established with colleges in the USA run by the MCA in the USA. There was a deliberate and continuing push to have MCAJ students attend JTS to train as pastors. Among the ways in which this was facilitated was by having an annual JTS day, a day on which students from across the country were invited to experience JTS for the day, and by offering a 50% scholarship to MCAJ pastoral students. Because of the breadth and depth of his involvement in the wider Christian community, many churches sent their students to JTS to be trained as well. And he pressed relentlessly for the JTS Alumni Association to develop and become active. JTS continued to be positively impacted by Reverend Spencer's knowledge and wisdom up to the very time of his departure to glory, 
as at the end of his tenure as president of the MCAJ and thus also the end of his tenure as chairman of the JTS board. He continues as a member of the board. Many of us valued him as an active and involved board member. And we recall his stubborn seeking after truth, his dogged pursuit of understanding, his impatient fight for real solutions to real problems, his independent thinking, and his respect for and appreciation of his fellow board members. His search for understanding and commitment to finding workable solutions were equally evident in his service as a member of the board's finance audit and general admin committee. It was this search for solutions that saw him think out of the box to raise funds for a cash-strapped seminary. His total and undying commitment to assist JTS in whatever way is possible is one key reason he will continue to be hailed as a true JTS champion. It was and is important that as the premier trainer of personnel for the MCAJ and other churches in Jamaica and the Caribbean, JTS holds true to the faith delivered to our fathers in the way the study of theology and Bible was pursued. Reverend Spencer was ever conscious of the board's role as the guardian of the statement of faith of JTS and as steward of JTS's Christian heritage. We pay tribute to him for the wisdom he shared and the guiding light he held up as the chief guardian and steward. We pay tribute to him not just for the things he said and did, but also for who he was and the many lives he impacted locally, regionally, internationally. We thank God that we had the privilege of serving with a man of sound and unsolid character who lived by high moral standards, remaining ever committed to a life of integrity. He was a true gentleman, one who always showed respect for others one who was a true and humble servant leader with a generous helping of the meekness of Moses, and one who was always focused on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. His service to Jamaica Theological Seminary, and by extension the world, should and will always be treasured. The JTS community offers condolences and prayerful support to Sister Madge Spencer, and the rest of the family, declaring his life made a difference, undoubtedly for the better. We pay our greatest tribute by ensuring that his legacy lasts and grows. Thank you for those words of tribute. We're going to spend the next few moments sharing perhaps a little bit of the devotional experience of the Reverend Mr. Peter Spencer in his the closing chapter of his earthly life. The songs to be led by Elder Gary Walker Emmanuel represent two of those songs that helped him, ministered to him, and expressed where he was. And we are going to sing it as we reflect. That will be followed by a third song. So many people find this a favorite, written by George Bernard, listed among the 300 top hymns. I never liked those things. It just means America believes itself with the world. But on this song, I think they probably speak for more people than themselves on a hill far away. When we sing this hymn, we will remain seated. We will stand for the first two, but sit for this, and then we will collect an offering. And the offering will be for the Kendall Development Fund. Kendall was one of the signature achievement of Peter Spencer and its continued development to serve not just the missionary church, 
but young people and the church worldwide or in Jamaica anyway. And therefore, we will use our gifts to continue the legacy. Gary, please lead us as we stand to sing the two songs, Show Me Your Way and My Hallelujahs Belong to You. Show me your way. in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your grace, your love, which has been shed abroad in our hearts. And of such you have used the life of our brother Spencer to have blessed all of us. A man who died yet liveth. Thank thee for the testimonies that was voiced on his behalf. And today, Lord, as we are about to receive this offering in honor of our brother, we pray that you would bless it and may it be used to the furtherance of your kingdom. For Christ's sake, amen.
Good morning. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. We would want to believe that some of time during the last moments of reflection that these scriptures scripture verses came into thoughts of Reverend Dr. Peter Nathaniel Cyril Spencer, the third child of Cyril and Bernie Spencer, knee Blanche. Peter Nathaniel, Nathaniel Spencer was born July 31st, 1938, in Manville, Manchester. Peter attended Manville Government School, as it was then called, and Manchester High School. Somehow he did not fit in well at that school, and his parents, more instrumentally his mother, decided that he was not going to drop out of school and certainly was not going to kick stone. <laughs> <laughs> Through much prayer and determination, she encouraged our father to apply to West Indian, West Indian Training College, now known as the Northern Caribbean University, for Peter to attend school. Although he had walked about three miles to school, getting up from 4 a.m., braving the cold manable air, this did not deter Peter. He was determined to succeed, and this he did, graduating from WITC with requisite certificate. Life held many delights for young Peter as he grew up in Manville, and would, when one would consider him mischievous and operated the, like a regular boy would. He loved riding his bicycle, swimming in ponds. Some of his friends from the Lower Battersea area were Neil Thompson, Junior Lewis, Noel Clark, and Louis Phillips. The story is told that one day Peter, Neil, and Louis, Noel says he wasn't there, went swimming in the pond in the community. Said pond was out of bounds to them by their parents, but boys will be boys. They took off their clothes, went swimming. Neil's mother happened to be passing by and saw the clothes on the dark bank, took up, one of the, of, took up one thinking that it was her son's and proceeded to her home. <laughs> Peter had to shout, Mrs. Thompson, you have the wrong clothes. <laughs> That's mine. Not Neil's. Imagine what would have happened if, <laughs> if he had not done that. Peter was very skilled in slingshot and loved bird shooting and throwing stones. The neighbor who lived below us suffered from much habit. Her rooftop was always the landing strip and she would always give the warning. Uno mind me I. <laughs> One just missed me eye. Another time, Neil, Peter, and Noel, this time Noel was there, went on bird shooting spree in Bermuda Road near the Jamaica Bible, Bible School. And an evangelist who was visiting the school at the time called out to them to stop shooting the birds as they were singing birds. The evangelist determined to continue his lesson in spearing the birds, made them stand in front of him and gave them a little booklet with the colors black, red, and white, called the Wonder Book, Wonder, the Wordless Book. His precious, they were taught to sing, my heart was black with sin until the Savior came in. <laughs> His precious blood, I know, 
washed my heart as white as snow. This was probably the first step towards Peter becoming a Christian. His childhood was very happy and stable while living in a disciplined family. Our father and a building contractor and mother, homemaker and excellent seamstress taught all four of us values and attitudes which shaped our lives for the future. Peter also had a close bond with his siblings. As some of you may know, Clive, <laughs> Bunny, Valerie and Peter were each born a year apart of each other and the closeness in the years meant that they did not a lot of did things do. a lot together including getting into mischief as well. His caring nature was evident from the early days when he would take his younger sister, June, to government, school, government infant school on the bicycle which caused him to be late for school for almost a whole term. In later years, this same love and care from his, for his family and his friends was always being demonstrated. A very good friend of our family, Vaughn Lawrence, spoke of the time he was visiting Jamaica and got into an accident. Vaughn thought he was in the wrong and not the other motorists. However, when Peter came onto the scene and, it, uh, things, and things changed, Peter, the lawyer, argued with the other motorists who by this time was exasperated with the whole thing. Caved in. Caved in and said, all right, me done. No, 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 no. I'm me wrong. You give me. You give me a headache. <laughs> I guess we could see um, Peter won the, say Peter, Peter won the case. There are other similar stories of Peter acting as a defense lawyer, which at one time led, his, led to, his, to June th thinking that he would miss his calling. Church attendance was required and our family participated in, in most of the church activities. During the teenage years, Peter came under the influence of the gospel of message, the, the, the message of gospel at Ridgemount United Church and Emmanuel Missionary Church, as well as the sound biblical teaching of the Manuel Keswick Convention. It was no wonder then that Peter surrendered his life to Jesus at Keswick in 1957. He joined Emmanuel Missionary Church and never looked back. We think of scripture the in the Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do know, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay? No, no, yeah. He became involved in youth evangelism and was an avid attendant at Youth for Christ services, which were held in this every Saturday night at the Manville Courthouse. We remember these service discussions held at the intersection of New Green Road and of New Green and Caluna Road before parting with the, the, the Jamaica Bible School group and further discussion at the intersection of Bonita Crescent and New Green Road. In 1960, he attended the newly founded Jamaica Theological Ceremony to prepare for a Christian missionary, where he obtained the Bachelor of Theology degree during one of his first, during being one of the first graduates in 1963. Upon graduation, he received an invitation to pursue graduate studies at Columbia Bible College Graduate School in South Carolina now Columbia International University, and was the first black student to be admitted to that college. In spite of the challenges and discrimination encountered off campus, 
he made many friends on college campus, which was more friendly and safe environment. Peter returned to Jamaica in 1965 and assumed the pastorate at the first missionary church on East Street, Kingston, and was ordained a minister of the gospel that year. He embarked on an effective preaching and teaching ministry, which characterized his ministry throughout, his, throughout the years. As a result of his ministry, as well as his personal witness, many persons choose to follow Christ. As the 1960s drew to a close, a romance began to blossom with a beautiful native of Manville and an active member of Emmanuel Missionary Church. She was involved in youth and child evangelism, gospel beams and beams, gospel, gospel teams, and of course, the music ministry. However, she was away attending school in Western Canada, and upon her graduation, the love struck pastor braved the cold Canadian weather to escort her back to Jamaica. This reserved bachelor pastor became engaged to Cecilia Marjorie, and in December, November. November 1970, wedding bells rang out in Mandeville. The couple moved to First Church Manse in Kingston to begin their marriage and family life. Parenthood was another role for the young pastor and his wife as their first child, Lorian, came along and sometime after, Greg. The family was a very close, participated in everything together. They laughed, played, worked, celebrated, and worshiped as a family. While serving as pastor of the then largest missionary church during the early 1970s, Peter also gave leadership to the denomination as president. The responsibility took him across the island of Jamaica and also overseas. The work grew and was evident that the president was needed on a full-time basis. And so, in 1979, Peter relinquished the pastoral ministry and assumed full-time leadership of the de denomination. He returned to First Church in 1998, serving until December 2008. Throughout his pastoral ministry, many persons came to know Christ because of his personal witness, his preaching, and counseling. Reverend Spencer has been recognized for his leadership roles in various religious organizations and events and well respected throughout the uh, wider church community. As you can see from the many tributes compiled in your program, in July 2010, he was confirmed the Honorary Doctor of Divinity by the Caribbean Graduate School of Theology. Today, we celebrate the life of Peter Nathaniel Cyril Spencer. We give thanks to Almighty God for lending him to us for these 81 years. This, this man who walked with the Lord Jesus Christ for over 50 years, we was loving and caring and faithful individual who touched the lives of many, both, both great and small, but never fought, well, never forgot who he was and how faithful his Lord was to him. He took comfort after being diagnosed with illness in the words of scripture that has always been a source of strength and direction for his life, and quoted this to his nephew Robin. Lamentations, Lamentations 3, 22 to 26. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for the compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, I say to myself. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. We will all miss him very much, especially 
his widow Madge and children, Lori and Greg, his grandchildren, Christian and Anya, his brother and sister and nieces and nephews. However, we take great comfort in the memories and in knowing where his soul is. As to be absent, As to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We love you, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Thanks. This is a tribute from a very, very good friend of our family. And you heard my brother Bonnie mention his name earlier in the eulogy, Vaughn Lawrence. Vaughn, unfortunately, could not be here. I read, this is a brief compendium of memories respecting one whose life we celebrate today. Many tributes will highlight his life as a husband, father, grandfather, his life of service, and most importantly, his life as a child and servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here I attempt to reflect on those memories as seen through three perspectives, that of friends, that of parents, that of God. And here I do not presume upon God, but draw only from that which he has allowed me to see. Friends, those pals of mine. As Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the only way to make a friend is to be one. I'm deeply humbled and blessed to have been there at the beginning, and I thank the Lord for the blessings that have fallen from the table into my life. Among his friends, he was simply one of the boys, enjoying the life and privileges afforded them. A few things stand out, the long walk to school and back. The new minister at church on learning of, his daily, of this daily trek to school asked the boys, Peter being one of them, do you walk this distance to school every day? One, and I won't say who, responded, no sir, we run sometimes. Some people thought Peter was aloof and dismissive because he would, would walk right by them without acknowledging a greeting or eye contact. It was as if he didn't see them. The fact is, he didn't. This explains why, with such athletic attributes, he did not play cricket. He wasn't blessed with great eyesight. More on this later. Peter was very adept at dominoes. We regularly played on the ground floor in the back of the telephone company building and never got evicted. Invariably, Peter would play out his hand, then sat back and watch the rest of us try to prove him wrong. He had an excellent grasp of the combinations and sequences in a set of dominoes. And after a few plays, had the game analyzed. Thank goodness we never played for money. <laughs> Parents, chosen by God to bring us into this world. Henry Ward Beecher says, we never know the love of a parent until we become one ourselves. At his mother's funeral, Clive, who his brother, spoke in glowing terms about the love shown by their parents. He also said something most telling. That is, their parents gave them the freedom to choose their own friends. Personally, I have been blessed to be considered one of the chosen. One of the great blessings of my life is that at every significant change I experience, whether by relocation from my birth home to Mandeville or in different living situations during my college years, I have always enjoyed the stability and care of a loving family. The parents of which we now speak set the tone for that. So my relationship with these two brothers has given some insights into the lives of their parents. 
Peter and his dad arranged for me to work in the family business during the long school holiday. I learned during that time that Peter could not see. The day his prescription glasses arrived, he tried them on in the office and immediately saw two things he had never seen before. The stop sign at the end of the street <laughs> and the calendar on the wall. A classic case of walking by faith. I'm certain that later in his ministry, he could identify with the poor soul in John 9, once I was blind, but now I see. <laughs> what a mother, the one chosen by God to bring us into this world. The late Dr. Christine Morgan's eulogy at Aunt Vernice's memorial tells it all. Aunt Vernice and I were prayer partners. One day she said to me, I have given my son to the Lord, unreservedly so. Now, as Paul Harvey would say, now you know the end of the story. We're going to change that to the beginning of the story. Thank God for mothers. God. Only God could be God. And this quote is from Arthur Rose. Everyone who called is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Isaiah 43, verse 7. It was the summer of 1957, a young preacher, Reverend Stephen Alford, rode into town. He had a message. It was clear. It was direct. It was convicting and delivered with clarity of purpose. The message, the way of God from Galatians 2.20. The way of death, I am crucified with Christ. The way of life, nevertheless I live. The way of faith, I live by the faith of the Son of God, the way of love, who loved me, the way of redemption, and gave himself for me. Something happened that week. Lives were changed, relationships restored. Restoration and reconciliation described the time. People were born again. Mandeville was at the mountaintop in more ways than one. Someone said, heaven has come to earth. This could have been a preview to the times of refreshing as promised in the scriptures. The journey started of spiritual exploration, spiritual growth and spiritual service. A core group of three led by, you guessed it, Peter Spencer, the late Christine Morgan, and yours truly, Vaughn Lawrence, met at the family home on Saturday mornings to study the scriptures. Not unlike the Ethiopian, we had no one to guide us. God was at work though. Not long hence, we realized that the Holy Spirit had taught us independently the, the requirement of baptism for the believer. The Lord graciously led us to Emmanuel Missionary Church where under the teaching of pastors George Hewitt and David Clark, supported by able men from the faculty of the Jamaica Bible School, and a man of special note, Mr. Ernest Clark. We as well as the work grew. Churches were planted and developed, which provided opportunities for service, namely Sunday school, youth fellowships, youth for Christ, open air witnessing, and helping the younger churches. In the course of time, change became inevitable and evident. Peter who had a good grasp of the scriptures, had a desire to learn more, and was led off to seminary. Christine, whose life and obsession was education, went to her full-time dreams, to fulfill her dreams, and yours truly tried to navigate the landmines of computer science. The Lord, true to himself, was faithful. Despite the divergence, the relationship was maintained in various ways working summer jobs together, spending time at a New England summer camp, touring the mansions of Newport, Rhode Island, attending a USA-Jamaica polo match, and Peter always says, I'm going to see the horses gallop. <laughs> or what I enjoy most was having Peter with or without his family fellowship with us at the local church I attend. The icing on the cake, was to have him minister to the saints whenever he was in town. 
For this they are very thankful, knowing, as they say in the hood, he is my homeboy. Our lives constituted one conversation. We always picked up where we left off. If you will please permit me three short anecdotes in closing. A feature of Youth for Christ then was a Bible quiz team competition. Peter and I were on opposing teams. We would study and prepare together. The book was Second Timothy. On quiz night, the moderator asked a question about meteorology. Peter jumped to his feet, answered the question, and gave the references and clues. Winter was coming, and Paul had asked Timothy to bring his coat. Somewhat envious, I questioned, how could he have arrived at the correct answer so quickly? You see, beloved, the same man that could analyze domino sequences and combinations, now under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, could analyze and understand scripture. Peter studied Bible characters. A favorite of his was the orator Tertullus in Acts, who spoke for the prosecution against Paul. Peter would practice his sermon delivery by emulating Tertullus. Thank God that was all he learned and used. Peter was deliberate in his delivery. He would parse each phrase before giving voice to it, such that what he said was exactly what he meant. So we have come from the cradle, along the path to school, cared for by a love of family, the new birth, the obedience in baptism, the training in discipleship, and the work of the ministry. So when the epilogue to this life is written, may it say, he has run the race with patience, he has fought the fight, he has kept the faith. I say amen, but I will miss the laugh. Keep laughing, my brother. When we stand to sing this next hymn, we won't stand again until the Tribute will be spoken by Laurie and Greg, daughter and son. This will be followed by the choir 
from First Missionary Church. Then we enter the phase of the word, the reading from Lamentation 3, 19 through 26, read by niece and Nevia Richard and Amanda Rose. The New Testament reading the epistle by the Reverend Dr. Peter Gard of the Associate Gospel Assembly, President of the Jamaica Evangelical Alliance, reading taken from Philippians 3, 7 to 14 and 20 and 21. And the gospel read by the Reverend Dr. Len Anglin, former president of Church of God, JTS board member, and many other things. The reading from the gospel, John 14, 1 to 6, verses 17 and verse 27. Then we will hear from Lieutenant Commander John McFarlane. And the message, the preacher, of all the things we will say of him, we will say that he was from Emmanuel during the 1970s, and that's all we need to say. <laughs> Prayer for the bereaved family to be said by the Reverend Dr. Orville Neal. Step to the side. There's a song that uh, Grandpa would always ask Anya to sing for him on the phone. And um, Anya, if she's brave enough right now, she'll, she'll sing that for us. Jesus. today. <laughs> okay. It was bra very brave of her to at least come up on stage. So, thanks. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Traditionally, family tributes on occasions such as these are expected, oh, sorry, one moment. Before we begin, my apologies, we would like to just ask everyone who is here who is a family member to please stand at this time for a brief moment. Anyone who is a family member, thank you. We would also like to acknowledge that there are many family members who are not able to be with us today. Uh, overseas in the USA, Canada, the UK, and the Bahamas, and one family member who is out at sea off the coast of Texas currently. Thank you. You may be seated. Traditionally, family tributes on occasions such as these are expected to reveal a different side of the person. However, daddy was pretty much the same in private as he was in public. Having said that, we will share some personal memories that may surprise you and that describe Daddy as our family knew him. We shared Daddy with a lot of people. Especially when we were young, Daddy often traveled locally and internationally to preach and attend church conferences, etc. He was committed and dedicated to everything he did and everyone he loved. Daddy was wise about many things, spiritual, relational, and financial, among others. He was a counselor, spiritual mentor, and encourager. Even during his illness, he would encourage everyone who called or came to visit him. To many of us, he was a financial advisor. Daddy had two trusted companions, his Bible and his calculator. <laughs> Daddy was always crunching numbers, following up on investments, and was an avid fan of the business reports on both TVJ and CBM. I knew not to speak to him when those reports were being aired. Daddy was a stock market enthusiast and an avid investor. One of his favorite places was JMMB. We often joked that JMMB Houghton Road was his second office. 
Here are a few things you might not have known about Daddy. Daddy loved to take naps. He had no problem sleeping anywhere. In the barber's chair and also on the plane, particularly before it, it, it took off. Boiled corn and roasted corn were some of his favorite foods. However, there was a recurring nightmare that he would have, which, often brought, which was often brought on when he would eat corn late at night. The dream had two versions. One was that he was riding a bicycle and he was being chased, chased by a large green lizard. The other version was that he was chasing a thief. In his attempt to escape or to chase, he would pedal furiously in the bed and end up kicking mommy. <laughs> so, as you might imagine, corn was forbidden as an evening treat. And some other favorite foods you may want to know. He loved rice and peas, red pea soup, patties, mixed nuts, Sister Benjamin's homemade ginger beer, and Sister Martin's fried sprat, among others. A little, a little well-known secret about Daddy was that he was often, no, make that usually, running late. So, on several occasions, he would get to the bank just after it closed. Inevitably, through his charm, politeness, smile, and tenacity, he often managed to get in after closing hours. <laughs> his philosophy was, just ask. And it was hard to say no to daddy. Not because of his commanding presence or his strong voice, but because he was an endearing, gentle giant of a man. On one occasion, dad had a meeting in Mandeville and we were going along for the journey since it was an opportunity to see the family there. He was already late when a policeman stepped out in the road ahead to pull daddy over. We could sense dad's anxiety building as he slowed the vehicle since we were a half hour from Mandeville and his meeting should have already started. Additionally, he still had to drop us off at grandma and grandpa's house. As the car came in line with the policeman, dad called out through the window, I can't stop now. I'm late for a meeting. <laughs> then kept on driving. <laughs> So, he, he was not perfect, <laughs> however, he was a perfectionist. He would dot every I and cross every T in everything that he did. He was diligent and committed in preparing his sermons. Each message he preached was a true labor of love and founded in deep prayer and reflection. The sermon, no sermon, was simply recycled irrespective of how short a lead time he had to prepare, Brother Omar. <laughs> Auntie Pat would say, when you want to get something done, tell Peter. His philosophy was that there was a solution for every problem, and he was determined to find it. Even just a mention of a need or an ideal would result in his researching and following up, making phone calls, getting information, and connecting people with contacts to help. That was daddy. He was a provider. If we needed something on the moon, he'd try to get it for us or to figure out a way to get it. For example, he assisted many of us with sourcing cars, dealing with land transactions and housing purchases, willingly sharing knowledge of processes and procedures, and helped many of us with the steps to achieve our dreams. Daddy had a pleasant, jovial disposition. Everyone felt comfortable around him. He was humorous, loved to laugh, and had a distinctive, authentic, from the belly, throw his head back laugh. If any of you remember. <laughs> he was never mean-spirited and always forgiving. He loved to talk with his grandchildren, watch them play, watch them grow. Despite this pleasant, jovial disposition, he was no pushover. Recently, after dad's surgery, 
I took him to a follow-up appointment. We, a follow-up doctor's appointment. We stopped for gas on the way home. Dad was extremely weak and tired and just wanted to get back home and lie down. Yet he insisted I go to the gas station, which was in the opposite direction from home. Because being the extremely frugal man that he was, he would only buy gas from the cheapest station. <laughs> there were three cars ahead of us at the pump and another car trying to cut in front of us. Daddy's eyes were almost closed as he sat in the passenger seat. I wasn't sure if he even noticed the car trying to bore in front of us. He turned to me and said, Greg, don't let that man get in front of us. <laughs> I, I said, I'll, I'll try. He responded, Greg, I cannot stand in discipline. Under no circumstances do you let this man cut in front of us. <laughs> no pushover. <laughs> Daddy loved to bargain, whether at a roadside stall in the countryside, where he would often start negoti negotiations with, how much for this one dollar hand of banana? <laughs> or bargain in a department store in the United States. On one trip abroad, he came back with a robe for mommy. He saw the robe in the store, knew he couldn't afford it, but also knew it was going on sale the next day. The only problem was he was leaving that day and would miss the sale. Dad convinced the store to give him the sale price that day so his lovely wife could get her robe. Daddy's ability to argue a point was legendary, as you heard before. <laughs> and anyone caught on the other end of his argumentative exposition would soon tire from trying to keep up with Daddy's logic. He called JPS whenever the power went out at home to report the outage and to interrogate the customer service rep to find out exactly when the power would be restored. If it didn't return at the appointed time, he would call them again and again until it was turned back on. Subsequent calls would lead Daddy to ask more probing questions, while inability to answer such questions would lead to pointed arguments as to why company representatives should be, should be able to answer these questions. On one such occasion, at the end of a long interrogation session during a power cut, there was a long pause, silence on the other end of the phone. Daddy had made all of his points, and the customer rep finally responded, is this Motty Perkins? <laughs> we, we have many pleasant memories of our childhood with daddy, including family trips to Mandible, always stopping to buy rose corn on Melrose Hill, just down the road here. There were trips other places across Ireland and overseas, including a trip to Disney World and SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida. He knew the sound of every bird, and for some, he had a song for their chirps. And when we were toddlers, he would tell us stories about the birds and the songs they would sing as he put us to sleep at night. Daddy was truly an exemplary family man. As a father, he was proud of both his children. He was also a proud grandfather, brother, and uncle. He delighted in the successes and achievements of family and friends alike. He was a modest man who usually observed the required decorum at any function. However, at my PhD graduation in, in Tampa, Florida, when they called my name, Dr. Lorianne Spencer, you could clearly hear him shout, yes, above all other applause on the video recording. He was a compassionate father. He slept in a chair by my bed, 
leaving his comfortable bed in his room to keep me company one very painful night when I had a very severe back injury. That's the kind of daddy he was. He counseled and encouraged each member of our family. He and mommy built a home literally with their own sweat and tears, a beautiful home where he enjoyed spending his time and quite fittingly, that's where he passed on. Daddy had very high standards. He didn't buy bread that was crushed and he would never buy a newspaper that was torn or rumpled in any way. And we didn't dare bring home a dirty or crushed newspaper either because we would hear about it. He was very formal. He would never answer the door in his undershirt, but would always put on his shirt and button it up fully to be respectful. We would like to read a few brief memories from uh, nieces and, and nephews. Uh, first is nephew Tommy. As a boy, I looked to the men in my life for direction, guidance, and an example. I have never shared this with anyone, but I secretly called him the voice. I thought that his voice was a living entity, a hug, or maybe a warm breeze. It certainly was captivating beyond expectation, and hearing Uncle Peter speak was a treat I never took for granted. Uncle Peter was a man of stature. It was easy to, for one to expect a voice of great volume, but what we received was one of strength and reason. Time spent in his company left me refreshed, informed and blessed for the beauty about my uncle is that wherever he was, whatever he was doing, whoever he spoke to, his voice carried it with it a respect of life beyond regular reasoning. A love that surpassed earthly understanding and the quiet yet powerful word of God. From his niece, Karen. I remember when Romy, my son, was going to school at the Caribbean Maritime University and the bank was giving him a hard time with the form, saying that he didn't have the correct form to do the transaction. Uncle Peter called the bank to intervene while Romy was there. In no time, Romy got through and was on his way out of the bank. Also, he brought bottled water to me regularly while I was studying at the Kingston School of Nursing as his way of supporting my dreams. Uh -huh. From his, his nephew, Richard. We thank the Lord that we are able to spend time with him over Christmas. I can't see without my glasses. <laughs> we inherited daddy's perfect sight. I mean, imperfect sight, both of us. <laughs> we thank the Lord that we were able to spend time with him over the Christmas and that we were blessed to live under his roof. He has guided us like a father, a good shepherd through many challenges in our own lives, including our relocation to Jamaica and given us wise counsel. He is the best man by far that I've ever knew. A man of integrity and loyalty and a faithful man of the people. We will continue to love and miss him and thank the Lord that he did not suffer. Rest well, Uncle Peter, father, counselor, man of God, faithful friend. Can go. go ahead. In conclusion, daddy was all about love. Kind, always giving and seldom taking. Forgiving, non-judgmental. Treated everyone with respect, no matter who you were. Everyone was worthy of his time and consideration. He and mommy truly loved each other. They would have celebrated 50 years of marriage this November. 
Mommy and Daddy, even when arguing with each other, did so with love and respect, saying, but honey, or but dear. <laughs> Very civilized arguments. <laughs> Daddy loved his family. He really did. All of us, and when I say family, I don't just mean immediate. Our family is very close, and that's the extended family. We're more like siblings rather than cousins and other members. So Daddy really loved his family, and in December, when he was home recovering from surgery, he expressed to us how he was so thankful to the Lord for the family he was blessed with, both immediate and extended. He was grateful for and loved how we all stood by and cared for each other. Family meant the world to him, and he showered our family with love. Most of all, that he was a man of great faith. One morning, not long before he passed, he told me of his devotion with the Lord that morning, how beautiful it was, and how much at peace he felt. My wife, Sandra, reminded me of his 70th birthday. After he made a wish and blew out the candles, we asked him, what did you wish for? Dad looked like a kid in a candy store, and with a bright smile on his face, he said, I just want to be more like Jesus. To many of you, Daddy was pastor, mentor, advisor, ministerial colleague, friend. To us, he was a one-of-a-kind husband, father, brother, uncle, and cousin. To us, he was legendary, extraordinary, irreplaceable, simply the best. A man who was truly after God's own heart. We leave you with two scripture verses. Um, you've heard them already today, but I think they're worth uh, repeating. First one from Psalms 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. The other from what I think was that his favorite biblical author, Paul. Second Timothy, verse four, six to eight. But you keep your head in all situations, enduring hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. We were just privileged as a family to have known Peter Nathaniel Cyril Spencer. Just a beautiful, beautiful person. Thank you. We miss you, Dad. And we love you. The first missionary church choir. Who could have seen what the eyes of the seeker would see?
there will actually be two readings from the Old Testament. Um, we will be reading from Lamentations chapter 3, and there has been another passage of scripture specially requested by Auntie Madge, which is Psalm 34, and so we'll be reading that for you as well. The book of Lamentations, chapter 3, reading verses 19 to 26. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. The reading is taken from Psalm 34, verses 1 to 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them, that fear him, and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. The word of the Lord. The New Testament reading is taken from Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14, 20 and 21. For what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Jesus, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body 
that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Just a little adjustment. The passage that I'll be reading will be from John 14, 1 to 6, and I will also read verses 17, 16, 17, and 27. When I start reading, you will start repeating with me because these are familiar words. John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. He believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In verse 16, verses 16 and 17, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the Lord cannot receive, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. In verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The word of the Lord. I count it a very great privilege to have been asked to be a part of this wonderful service. Um, it's, it's, it's a privilege because Peter and I go back over 50 years, a long, long time ago. Um, from Mandeville Keswick, because of my mother, Kathleen McFarlane, and my uncle George Webster. And then, in the very early 60s, singing at First Missionary, both as a soloist, as part of the Teen Time Male Chorus. And then later on, you know how things go. He got married two months before me, and our children went to school together. Then we served together on the Kesey Council. And everything you hear about Peter is true. He is a man who is very patient, very gentle, but he knows exactly what he wants, and he's going to get it. <laughs> but this song that I'm gonna sing is a song which I believe Peter could well have been singing in his last few days. And I hope you will recognize that this is perhaps the Believer's National Anthem.
who is moderating did say that you should enjoy the last stand because that was going to be your last. But you would like to take a stand now, wouldn't you? Just stand up. Amen. Because it's going to be a long time from now. <laughs> that you'll have another stand. You may be seated. I have to tell you though, brothers and sisters, that I did get some special and stern warning and that I should endeavor to emulate the great creature, our brother and friend, Peter, in many, many ways, except <laughs> Except. 
But to be candid, I remember having listened to what is in my memory as the shortest sermon that the Reverend Peter Spencer delivered. It was exactly eight minutes. Eight minutes. And some of you would say, but it takes him more than eight minutes to parse a sentence and then to be more precise, to explain the rest of it. But it was right here in this auditorium, many years ago, at one of our conferences. And... Uh, for whatever the reason, we were running hard against time, and the Reverend Peter Spencer had to give a charge to all of us, conference, and certainly to the ministers. And he spoke very, very passionately about becoming all things for all men's sake in order that he might win some. We'll not soon forget that. But this is not such a conference. <laughs> and we are here today, colleagues on the platform and in the audience, and the bereaved family, Sister Spencer, and the extended family, congregation. On behalf of my family, my wife Thelma and the children, I want to join with so many of you to express sincerest condolences to all of us on the home going of this beloved servant of God, this state man, this giant of the faith. And we are encouraged by your presence, not only because you are demonstrating your love for the family and Brother Peter demonstrating your own sense of respect and honor towards him, but especially so on a Tuesday morning. And the fact too that so many of you have come from far distances to be here. We thank you most sincerely. This is indeed a strange time for Joy and sadness. Perhaps, though, more joy than sadness. Since we have the strong assurance that our brother Peter is at rest in the arms of his loving Savior and Lord. So we bless God that we can only see by faith what he is already enjoying in the presence of the God he loved and served so fervently. Yes, he is, as you have heard, absent from us in the flesh. But our faith teaches that he is present with the Lord. My wife and I reflect with great fondness our last visit with Brother Peter and the family, in early December, the steadfast faith of both himself and the family will remain in my memory, I trust, for all my life, and an encouragement to me in the future. So the scriptures that are chosen and read are all scriptures that he memorized and recited as expressions of his own faith in this God whom he had loved so much. The family's confidence that regardless of the circumstances we face in this life, God is perfecting his purpose in us and through us. Such steadfast confidence belie their identity with the suffering of their long life partner, father, friend, 
and counselor. Because the family knew the grace of God. And have found that the faith of the gospel is not just something we talk about. But it really works. Our beloved brother Peter was able to recite the testimony of the psalmist David. You have given me the shield of your salvation. And your right hand supported me. And your gentleness made me great. Psalm 18 and 35. Now, as has already been stated time and again throughout this celebration this morning, a brother Peter was a humble man. A brother Peter was a good man. He was a wise, genuine, and gentle servant leader. He loved the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he loved the Christ of the gospel. If he had been able to instruct me about this sacred responsibility today, I imagine that he would desire above all things that the gospel be made plain, that Christ be exalted, and that every participant is encouraged and persuaded to prepare to meet your God. So ever since his transition, and more so since I was graciously given this honor to share in this capacity by the family, my mind has been directed to those awesome yet assuring words of Psalm 116 and verse 15, known I suspect by many of you by heart. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We are informed that this verse was recommended for singing at the funerals of the people of God. Those who genuinely love him. From church history, we learn that when St. Cyprian, Bishop of Antioch, and indeed the first Bishop of Africa, who was martyred, that when he was put to death during the Decian persecution, as he marched towards his martyrdom, he cheerfully sang, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. These, my friends, are words of cheer indeed, because they bear a message of great grace. Yes, they teach us that the Lord places the highest value on the homecoming of his beloved saints. Yes, his saints. But who are those? What are those? In English, the word saint, as you're aware, means the holy ones. Similarly, in the Hebrew Old Testament, saints referred to as saints really means those who are, have exemplified themselves in holiness. Those who are separated by their eminent piety. Some authorities, however, have observed that in the original script, a different word was used by the psalmist, which, though still carries the idea of holiness and godliness, the form in which it was used refers to those who are the mercied ones. Those who are the mercied ones. These are the people who have received divine mercy. Hence, some respectable translators prefer the translation, the beloved, 
Precious in the sight of the Lord are the beloved ones. They are precious because they are beloved of Christ. Men think of saints as those specially, peop um, specially uh, anointed people who, um, by virtue of their demonstrations of holiness, and because also of their, their ritualistic commitment, and also because of their tradition, have earned that standing. But God's word describes every sincere disciple of Jesus Christ as God's saints. Because every sincere believer in Christ has received God's mercy. What makes people into saints is not the effort of their own flesh, nor the rituals of their religion, but their reception of the mercy of God in and through Jesus Christ as Lord. So a saint is one who by the divine mercy of God has been brought under the terms of the covenant of grace and by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit has been initiated into a personal union with the true saint, the supremely holy one, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. That, my friends, was Peter's testimony. That, my beloved brothers and sisters, was his experience. Peter was born a sinner. A sinner by nature and a sinner by practice. But he died a saint. Not by any merit or work of his own. But because God set his love upon him. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, his covenant head. God caused that Christ died for him shed his blood for him and rose again for him and the Holy Spirit united Peter by faith to Jesus Christ in an inseparable union so that today I repeat he may be absent from us what do you tell me according to your faith where he is he's present with the Lord what an assurance this it was for Peter so he blossomed into the man of God that you and I have come to know, to love, and to admire. He believed firmly that God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. Our brother Peter knew that experience and came to be made the righteousness of God in Christ. He became, he came to be constituted one of God's saints because God in mercy brought him to the cross. God in mercy caused him to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. God in mercy has put his sin away as far as the east is from the west. Those sins have been laid upon Jesus. And in turn, Jesus has laid upon our brother Peter the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! What a savior! Our text in Psalm 116 and 15 speaks of the precious death of God's people. Precious in the sight of of the Lord is the death of his saints, of his mercied ones. The phrase, in the sight of the Lord, tells us that this is a reality that is clear to Almighty God, but not necessarily so clear to us as human beings. We know all too well that death is the painful penalty for sin, Ever since our four parents disobeyed the instructions of Almighty God. In fact, in verse 3 of this same psalm, the psalmist himself recited, The pains of death encompassed me, and the pangs of Sheol lay hold of me. 
I found trouble and sorrow. So in the eyes of men, the death of a saint looks exactly like that of anyone else. We see believers suffering in the hospitals. We see and we know of sincere believers who fight battles with cancers of all different types. We see many demented and others have to grapple with the awesome, awful disease of Alzheimer's. Perhaps this, according to the writer of Ecclesiastes, is a common lot of all of us. There is a righteous man who perishes, he says, and there is a wicked man who suffers likewise. The same thing happens to all, we may say. But that is also, that is only surface deep, I might submit. For the death of the unbeliever brings no joy to the heart of Almighty God. On the contrary, the scriptures make clear that the Lord keeps his eyes upon his people in very particular and peculiar ways as they approach death. So there's no accident in the death of a Christian. There is no tragedy in the death of a Christian. There are no mistakes in the death of a Christian. May I say to you there is absolutely no eternal loss in the death of God's people. Guys, God's eyes are fixed on his people. And therefore on Sunday morning when our brother Peter took his last breath here on earth, his soul was already winging its way to glory to be with his maker. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, the psalmist says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This is our assurance, my friends. This is our divine protection. This is what gives the people of God comfort and support in times like this. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his mercied ones. This is more than fancy poetry. This is sober biblical theology. This is our strong assurance. There's something joyful about the home going of Brother Peter. There's something that caught the attention of heaven. As you can just imagine, not only the 24 elders around the throne, but all the angels were summoned. To welcome this pilgrim, this servant of God who has struggled and has fought a good fight. This man of God who has kept the faith. This man of God who has run the race. This man of God who during his lifetime, as you can all imagine and heard, kept his eye on that prize which his father, his God, his Savior has laid up for him. And not only for him, but for all of us. For all of us in this place who love the appearing of the Lord. Oh, brother Peter is only here in this casket. But the real man who lived and loved and longed for the presence of his Savior is at home with his Lord. And oh, I hear the psalmist, precious in the sight of God, is the death of his saints. Precious means valuable. Something upon which God places immense value. It may seem strange that God would place such high value on the death of his people. And I confess to you, it baffles me. I'm still grappling with the truth of it all. But I've come to know that all of scripture measures up to prove this fact that for all those who die in Christ it is a precious moment. Permit me please 
to show to you just three examples. And yes, they are not going to be taking us forever. Three examples. Why well, I believe that God values the death of his people so precious. One, it is because the believer's death is a purchase made by the death of Christ. Our death is precious to God because even our death was paid for by the death of Jesus Christ. The British clergyman John B. Phillips says it this way, and I borrow from him. The death of the Christian is a covenant blessing brought, bought him by the blood of Christ. This is the gospel's view of death. God finds nothing of value in the death of the lost. But in the death of his own, he finds something worth treasuring. Their death is of great value to him because of the death of his son, Jesus Christ. It is true, my friend. Christ died bearing the curse of the law and of sin for Peter, Nathaniel, Cyril, Spencer. But he did die and bear the curse of, the sin, of sin and the law for all of us as his trusting children as we learn from the book of Galatians. Yes, he entered into heaven, into the realm of death, or rather he went into the realm of death and tasted of the bitterness of death. He drank the awful cup of the wrath of God's judgment against sin. He suffered the sting of death. He conquered death. Yes, and Christ robbed that cruel enemy of its terror over his redeemed people. By his death, Christ has purchased both his peace and our place with God. That settles it, my friend. My peace has been purchased. My place in the company of God among the redeemed has also been secured. How? Only by the death of Jesus Christ. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough. The songwriter says that he died for me. It is enough. The second reason why I think that the death of Christ is so precious, the death of the believer is so precious in the sight of God, is the fact that it is the product of the resurrection. The product of the resurrection. You know, friends, I would like for us as we approach the Easter season to think again of what it means that Christ rose from the dead. He rose from the dead to ensure that just as he was dead and just as he was buried and just as neither death nor the grave could control him, there is coming a day, if you'll bless the Lord with me, that those who die in the Lord shall also be raised by the power of the Spirit of God. The product of the resurrection of Jesus, when he died and rose from the dead, he became the first fruits of them that slept. He became the forerunner of a vast army of the redeemed saints who will live forever. Because Jesus lives today. We sing it. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. All my fears are gone. Friends we can sing that with confidence. Because of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the product. You and I are the product of that great experience. Some could not understand it. And even today, many battle to come to grips with it. 
But the scripture said if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, then you and I are still dead in our sins. And our preaching makes no sense. But thank God, my friends, the grave could not hold him. Death could not hold Jesus because he had conquered death and consequently guaranteed that all those who die in Christ will experience the joy of the resurrection of Jesus. I wonder if someone will give the Lord some praise in the house of God. The proof, the product of the resurrection. It is why God the Father could say, it is precious in my sight when my children come home. Oh, hallelujah. There's a third reason. A third reason. Yes, it is a purchase of my own death in the death of Christ and it is a product of that great resurrection. But I close by telling you, it is a proof of Christ's intercession. In his high priestly prayer, Jesus was in dialogue with his father. Hear him in John 17 and 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. The glory that you have given me before because you loved me and you gave that to me before the foundation of the world. Jesus was praying my friends for his people, not just that God the Father would sustain us in life, not just that he would give us success in our service, but specifically about our death, our transition. So we may said, safely say that the true meaning of the death of the Christian is that it is the Father's answer to the intercession of his beloved son. Father, I have died for Peter Spencer. Father, I have shed my blood for his redemption. Father, he is mine. He's mine by covenant, for you gave him to me. He's mine by regeneration. For your spirit has united him to me in loving and living faith. Yeah. He is mine for all eternity. Father, now I want him to come and behold my glory. Yes, yes, yes. Father, I intercede for you. I intercede to you for my beloved son who has embraced faith in me way back in the 1950s, but has made it his life's vocation to pursue that faith, to understand what it means, and to live it out so that his own children and grandchildren and all those who have been privileged to disciple may rise and call him blessed. And we'll be able to see, say with confidence, he has indeed fought a good fight. He has indeed kept the faith. He has indeed run his course. And now he's in line to receive the crown of righteousness. Can you see why the, dead, the Lord should say, Precious in the sight, in my sight, is the death of my mercied ones. Oh yes. From a human standpoint, death is, is a terrible enemy. We have all shed some bitter tears because of its cruelty and its pain. But in the eyes of our loving God, is this all there is to it? Let the words of that beautiful poem entitled, Is This Death by Mary Oliver? who died only recently, actually in January 2019, 
speak to us. It is not death to die, to leave this weary load amidst for brotherhood and high, to be at home with God. It is not death to bear the wrench that sets us free from dungeons chains, to breathe the air of boundless liberty. It is not death to fling aside the sinful dust and rise on strong, exalting wings to live among the just. Jesus, thou Prince of Life, thy chosen cannot die. Like thee, they conquered in the strife to reign with thee on high. Is this death? Were Peter just an upright, moral, and kind, and loving man? Were Peter just a devoted husband, father, sibling, and friend? Were he just a trustworthy brother and colleague? If that were all we could say, then yes, this would be death. But having been washed in the blood of Jesus, having been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, Peter has and will forever declare, this is all my plea. Jesus died for sinful man and Jesus died for me. As for me, I shall behold his face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Hallelujah. Dear Moody once said, One day, you will read in the newspapers that Moody is dead. He says, don't believe it. For Moody will be more alive than he has ever been. This then, my brother, for us, is not goodbye to our, brother, our beloved brother Peter. It is just good night. We will see you, brother P, in the morning. For precious, yes, precious in the sight of the Lord. As a death of his mercied ones. Purchased by the death of Christ. Product of the resurrection of Christ. Privileged proof of the intercession of our Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, if this were your casket today, could you say with assurance, my death is precious, not painful to God. Could you? Amen. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well spoken, brother. Amen. How can I let this moment go by without saying how much, how indebted I am to this man and for God sending him into my life. It's my, my friend, yes. my pastor, my mentor. I sat under his ministry for six years at First Missionary Church. He baptized me. He was the, the icon that I looked to in terms of my ministerial formation. And what an example he was. Hallelujah. And an inspiration. He continues to be. And I've always kept in touch with him. 
I saw him in the hospital and I shared with him in December how much before I left for the United States, I shared it. I said, brother, I don't know what's going to happen, but listen, I want to tell you how much you have impacted my life. And I raced to complete a book in his memory. And it was completed in January. I wanted to put it in his hands. It's entitled, Climbing the Utmost Heights, Romans chapter 8. To God be the glory and the memory of my beloved friend and pastor, Peter Nathaniel Spencer. Thank you, God. I'm going to ask the congregation to stand and the family to remain seated as we... I'm going to ask you all to stretch forth your hands. This might not be your toward them invoking God's blessing yes. shall we pray Lord God the refuge and strength of all those who put their trust in you Lord God we thank you because of this great hope of the resurrection yes. that we can face the eventualities of life and the finality of death and God, we lift up before you this family who are grappling with the sense of loss, the numbness. Yes, they are reliving the wonderful memories that he has left behind them as a legacy. But God, as individuals, they do cry. They do miss husband and father and grandfather. And we ask you to be very dear to them in these moments. And God, we thank you that there is indeed a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where they can find repose, they can find the strength and the comfort. And long after this service and the friends would have taken their, their flight, they will be alone with you and we ask you to sustain them in those moments. And fold them in your loving arms. And God help them to know that our brother has left a, a tremendous legacy that will live on. That he, he has received it for him. It is, you called him to higher service. You called him to graduation. To stand at the winner's podium to receive his prize hallelujah and what a proud moment it is for brother Peter to stand triumphant again and we thank you dear God that you're able to present us faultless before your presence with exceedingly great joy to the only wise God our father be glory dominion and power both now and forevermore amen and amen eternal God and our father the maker of heaven and earth, the one who undergirds us with your everlasting arms. We draw nigh to you once again to thank you for the life of Reverend Dr. Peter Spencer. We thank you for the legacy he has left behind we thank you for the impact that he has made on the life of the church. We pray, Almighty God, that those of us who are left behind will walk, talk, as he would have, so that when we would have come to the end of our days here on earth, like him, we would have left a legacy. We thank you for the assurance that we have today. Thank you, God. That it is well with his soul. May you continue to lead us. May you continue to guide us. May the path ahead of us 
be inspired by the life of our brother, father, friend, and colleague. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.
and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I John saw the holy city new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise this afternoon that you are our God. Yes. Thank you that you are not the God of the dead, but of the living. Yes. So Lord, those who are in touch with you are alive. Yes. And so this evening, as we come to commit the remains of your son, we give you all the glory. We give you all the thanks and the praise. Thank you for the great assurance that we have in you. Thank you now, Father. Take us through, we ask, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Man born of a woman, is of a few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away. Like a fleeting shadow, he does not endure. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Inasmuch as it has pleased the Lord, in whose power are life and death to remove our departed Peter, Nathaniel, Cyril, Spencer from our midst. We therefore commit the body to the earth, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, awaiting the resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord by whom each must come forth in his own order when this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality and all shall appear in his presence according to the mighty 
working whereby he's able to subdue all things unto himself. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Hallelujah. So. I first him, O oh God, how great thou art. O oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the star, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. After three, two, three. O oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider
is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now this I say, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be trained. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then the saying which is true, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We'll sing again, great hymn of the Christian church. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. You know, I heard somebody say, made a comment that uh, Reverend Spencer lost the battle with cancer. I couldn't disagree more. He didn't lose the battle. Amen. He was called home from the battlefield Amen. by the commander Amen. general. Amen. Amen. He didn't lose the battle. Hallelujah. He was called home from yes. the battlefield. Amen. Praise God. Yes. I just wanted to get that straight. Amen. 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 Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my God. There is no shadow of grace.
I, Jesus, have sent my angels to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who is here say, come. Let him who is thirsty come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Another hymn that we're going to sing. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. And that is what we sing about now because you know the great Apostle Paul in Romans 8, he asked five unanswerable questions. And we have heard a lot of things at church today. And now that we have heard all these things, what next? Mm. And so the first question was not one of the five. He says, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Then he goes and he said, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And when he concludes everything, he says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life. That's the last scripture that Reverend um, Spencer and I shared. I am persuaded. And we, we talked about the, the text that the apostle used the 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 the, um, the perfect tense. I was persuaded a long time ago and I am still persuaded now. Right. Yeah? Oh yes. That neither death nor life. Mm. And we're not scared. You know the Apostle Paul, he went to the <laughs> top draw and he took out the biggest and the baddest one, death. Yes. He says, I am persuaded that neither death mm. nor life. And then he goes on. But You know, we have a way of saying in Jamaica, what don't cost life, don't cost nothing. Yeah, so he attacks the biggest one first, death. I am persuaded that neither death. And then he comes down and says, knowing all these things, we are what? More than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that we do. The crowds are Soon the pearly gates will open. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This evening we triumphantly yeah, yeah. without fear yes. without doubt Hallelujah. because we have the assurance yeah. that our brother yeah. is resting you, Lord. with you, thank you Lord. absent oh, from the body yeah. but yeah. present with the you Lord that, oh. we thank you Lord thank you, Jesus. Yes. we thank Hallelujah. you for this service yeah. in its entirety oh, God. we thank, thank you for you, being with us yeah. for directing yeah. the proceedings yeah. and we oh, thank God. you Lord thank that you. we have now yeah. Bring to a close yes. this chapter, Jesus. and we look forward, Lord, yeah. to well, Lord. meeting yeah. our brother again. Yes. Yes. We well, thank Lord. you yes. that we do not sorrow yeah. at those who well, have no Lord. hope, yeah. because yeah. our hope yeah. is in our Lord Jesus Christ, yes. who conquered yes. death Conquer and has brought life and immortality yes. yes. to Lord. life Hallelujah. through the gospel. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, thank you, Lord. we commit. Oh. The grieving Thank family you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. into your hands. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. In the days and weeks Lord, and months Lord, ahead, we, we know that you will be Lord. with them. Oh, my Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you. For the Comforter, yes. the Blessed Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. Your Holy word Jesus. says, Lord, you will not leave us comfortless, thank you, Lord. but you will come to us. Thank you, Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you for all that has been said yeah, and done. Lord. We give you the glory, you, the honor, and the praise Hallelujah. in the wonderful, matchless name oh, of Jesus Christ, Hallelujah. our Lord and our Savior. Yes. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling yes. and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Family, we would like to say a big thank you for the community and to the community for the support shown today. We're always mindful that it doesn't end today. And of such, we ask that you continue to keep the family in your prayers. And we trust that we will continue as always as the scripture um, enjoins us to bear he one another's burden. The Lord be with you. Travel safely and continue to love your neighbor as you go forward. Let's see.